section thirty two of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty two we now proceed to continue the history of banda having set out for the punjab in accordance with the guru's instructions and in due time taken up his post on an eminence near buria he found there the reinforcements promised by the guru they came in numbers and clamoured for food to supply themselves they were obliged to resort to forcible measures upon this there arose a violent altercation between the sikhs and the villagers in which the latter were put to the sword the inhabitants of two or three other villages were similarly treated on seeing the license granted to banda's troops all the robbers of the country flocked to his standard an outcry everywhere arose and the people went in large numbers to complain to the governor of mustafabad a city five or six miles to the west of berea where were two thousand imperial troops under arms and ready for any emergency these were dispatched with two large guns against banda whereupon many of his mercenary recruits deserted him he encouraged all who remained and promised them protection and pecuniary assistance he then pulled forth one of the guru's arrows drew a line on the ground with it and said that no bullet or arrow should cross the demarcation thus made upon this his troops rallied and made such a successful defence that the mohammedans all fled leaving their cannon behind them after this victory several of the deserters returned and rejoined banda's army his forces then proceeded to mustafabad and laid it waste banda's next expedition was against sandhara the imperial troops stationed there came forth to oppose him but were easily defeated they fled and took shelter behind their city walls banda's forces with great bravery captured the fort and levelled it with the ground then ensued a general massacre of the inhabitants banda next marched and laid siege to samana a considerable town in the state of patiala here there was a sanguinary battle the city was sacked and the male inhabitants put to the sword he then proceeded to sarhind on the march his troops took supplies forcibly from villagers wazir khan on hearing that banda was marching against him sent to the viceroy of lahore for assistance banda plundered ambala on the way he then marched to banur where he was encountered by wazir khan's army which had marched from sarhind to oppose him the battle began on the following day when several of the mohammedans were slain wazir khan and banda engaged in single combat banda thus addressed him o sinner thou art the enemy of guru gobind singh thou hast shown him no respect but on the contrary hast put to death his innocent children and thereby committed a grievous and unpardonable crime the punishment for which i am now going to deal thee thine army and thy country shall be destroyed at my hands upon this banda struck off his head with one blow of his sword then the whole of the mohammedan army fled followed by the sikhs who possessed themselves of their horses arms tents cannon and other munitions of war and then advanced in triumph to sarhind there they effected a general massacre the sikhs captured sukhanand who had instigated the murder of guru gobind singh's children they put an iron ring in his nose and passing a rope through it led him round the streets to beg at every shop he was shoe-beaten until he died such of the inhabitants as were not killed prostrated themselves before the conqueror he was not disposed to mercy but gave an order to raise the city to the ground and plough up its site in the process large treasure was found which materially assisted him in his further career of rapine bloodshed and devastation banda then went on an expedition to the east and plundered most of the hill rajah's states 
after this he made a pilgrimage to anandpur and performed reverent worship at the shrine of guru teg bahadur he then made pilgrimages to the places hallowed by the visits of guru gobind singh the raja of chamba in order to conciliate him sent him a supremely beautiful girl she had large eyes her limbs were graceful and delicate and she is described by the enthusiastic chronicler as the very image of the goddess of love banda on seeing her parted with his caution and completely forgot the guru's injunctions he dived into the ocean of sensuality and thought not of the fate that awaited him on the forfeiture of his continents having subjected all the hill chiefs banda planned a tour in the bist doab and proceeded to jalandhar where he killed the mohammedan male inhabitants the mohammedan women were converted to sikhism and became wives of the sikh soldiers by the ceremony of anand he thence went into the manjaha and plundered batala thence he marched to lahore and put its viceroy aslam khan and all his principal officers to the sword he there heard that troops sent by the emperor bahadur shah were marching against him he proceeded to meet them as far as ludhiana and defeated them he thence went on a pilgrimage to the shrine of guru nanak in the gurdaspur district where he met by ram Kaur, sixth in descent from by buddha banda induced him to remain with him probably with the object of persuading him in imitation of his pious ancestor to invest him with the dignity of guru banda had by this time obtained supreme power from the neighbourhood of dihli on the south to lahore on the north he appointed his own police levied revenue and ruled the country baba binad singh whom the guru had sent with him gave him great assistance in administration he endeavoured to dissuade him from the chamba liaison and another of a disreputable character which banda had also contracted on one occasion when baba binad singh remonstrated in open darbar with him for his departure from ascetic principles and the injunctions of the guru an altercation arose of such a, a violent character that binad singh drew his sword and would have cut off his head had not khan singh interposed khan singh then foretold the departure of banda's glory and his ignominious death banda next paid a visit to the great temple at amritsar he gave out that he had been empowered by the guru to claim succession to the guruship the sikhs then reflected that he did not live according to the rules prescribed for the khalsa in order to make trial of him they put meat before him at which he as the result of early prejudice became horrified he fell into a passion with the sikhs who had thus made trial of him and they in turn grew enraged with him for refusing meat allowed by their religion and for his manifold irregularities the result was that the sikhs divided into two factions those who rejected banda were called the tat khalsa or real sikhs and those who accepted him the bandai khalsa or followers of banda for the sikh salutation wa guru ji ka khalsa wa guru ji ki fata he substituted fatah darshan victory to the sect an alteration which was deemed apostasy from the orthodox faith another cause of the dissatisfaction of the sikhs with banda was that he disregarded a letter of mata sundari to the effect that he had now accomplished the mission imposed on him by the guru namely to bring the governor of sarhind to justice and it was time for him to arrest his career of carnage and spoliation banda said that as mata sundari was only a woman she was not competent to give him advice or orders many sikhs thinking that this was a slight to the guru's wife deserted banda and from that time his power began rapidly to decline when the defeat of the army sent by the emperor against banda was heard of in nander it was attributed to the emperor's failure to keep his promise to the guru banda continued to pursue his violent career until bahadur shah himself at the head of a powerful avenging army proceeded against him banda not deeming his troops sufficient to cope with the imperial host 
fled to the mountains and took refuge in a fort called logar the imperial army besieged him but the wily chief escaped in a desperate sally a hindu who remained behind to personate him was sent by the subadar's orders to be executed in dili very soon after this the emperor died in lahore and then ensued the usual oriental scramble for the throne his eldest son jahandar shah who has been described as a drunken profligate succeeded but was murdered by his nephew farooq siyar son of bahadur shah's second son azim ul shan while this struggle was in progress banda came forth from his hiding-place and again commenced his depredations bayazid khan the new viceroy of sarhind went forth with his troops to oppose banda but was killed while at his prayers by a follower of the outlaw on this the emperor farooq siyar sent abd ul samad khan also known as diller jang to arrest banda's progress when diller jang thought his troops had surrounded banda there was no banda to be seen he and his followers had again fled and disappeared in the mountains dailer jang took up his quarters at lahore to await the outlaw's reappearance after a year banda again emerged from his fastnesses and took possession of kala nuar and santokgar he sent letters in all directions inviting the sikhs to join his standard in two months he received considerable reinforcements and defeated sher muhammad daim the general commanding at ambala the latter then went to dailer jang at lahore to complain of banda's lawlessness and tyranny and concert more stringent measures for his repression dailer jang sent the ambala general's complaint to the emperor upon this the emperor ordered mir ahmad khan the general commanding at aurangabad to join his forces with those of dailer jang and the other generals in the punjab and all proceed against banda the latter took refuge in Gurdaspur and strongly entrenched himself the mohammedan army besieged him the sikhs were reduced to such extremities that they killed for food all animals in their possession baba banad singh who had hitherto accompanied banda now abandoned him banda when rendered totally helpless sent a letter under flag of truce to dailer jang offering to surrender if his life was spared and his troops treated with consideration dailer jang promised to intercede with the emperor for him and held out hopes of his pardon when banda gave up his arms he was not allowed an interview with dailer jang but placed at once with all his followers under restraint they were all sent to dili with many circumstances of disgrace banda himself being put into an iron cage to be disposed of by the emperor here english testimony is available the members of an english mission who went from calcutta to dili in seventeen hundred and fifteen to petition the emperor for certain privileges have left on record that they saw a procession of eight hundred sikh prisoners march through dili with two thousand bleeding heads borne aloft on poles the sikhs vied with one another for precedence in death while the executions were in progress the mother of one of the prisoners a young man just arrived at manhood having obtained some influential support pleaded the cause of her son with great feeling and earnestness before the emperor she represented that her son had suffered imprisonment and hardship at the hands of the sect his property was plundered and he was made prisoner while in captivity he was without any fault of his own introduced into the sect and now stood innocent among those sentenced to death farooq siyar pitied the woman and mercifully sent an officer with orders to release the youth she arrived with the order of release just as the executioner was standing with his bloody sword upheld over the young man's head when she showed the imperial order the youth broke out into complaints saying my mother speaketh falsely i with heart and soul join my fellow-believers in devotion to the guru send me quickly after my companions needless to say his request was cheerfully granted here baba khan singh and baba baz singh whom the guru had sent with banda succeeded in effecting their escape gulam husain khan author of the siyar ul matakarin states that 
banda's son was put on his lap and banda was obliged to cut his throat in the manner of mohammedan sacrifice he did so not unwillingly lest the child should afterwards be circumcised and made a mohammedan mohammed amin khan when he had an interview with banda said to him the marks of sense and intelligence are visible on thy countenance how is it thou hast never thought about the recompense of thy deeds and that in a short span of life with a dreadful futurity thou hast been guilty of such cruelty and of such detestable actions to hindus and mussulmans he replied in all religions and sects whenever disobedience and rebellion among mortal men passeth all bounds the great avenger raiseth up a severe man like me for the punishment of their sins and the due reward of their deeds when he wisheth to desolate the world he placeth dominion in the hands of a tyrant when he desireth to give the tyrant the recompense of his works he sendeth a powerful man like thee to prevail over him and to give him his due reward in this world as thou and i can see on this banda's flesh was torn from his body by red-hot pincers and he expired under the horrible torture during his execution he uttered the following warning to his fellow-creatures who hath not suffered for his acts who hath not reaped what he hath sown forget not that you shall obtain retribution for your deeds wheat springeth from wheat and barley from barley though such was the fate of banda yet guru gobind singh had infused such martial spirit into his sikhs that they not long after obtained possession of the panjab and put an end to mohammedan supremacy end of chapter thirty two section thirty three of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty three mata sahib kaur the guru's youngest wife died of grief very soon after her husband she was cremated at the shrine of guru har krishan in dihli when ajit singh the boy adopted by mata sundari the guru's remaining wife grew up she provided him with a wife he begot a son called hathi singh ajit singh imitated the late guru as much as possible he used to hold court call himself a guru and entertain a retinue he endeavoured to obtain from mata sundari the arms belonging to guru har gobind which the late guru had given to sahib kaur on her departure from nander ajit singh believed that if he wore them every one would hail him as guru when he made his demand for the arms he was sharply reproved by mata sundari on this he drew his dagger to kill her but some friends interposed mata sundari then cursed him said he should forfeit his faith and die an untimely death one day as he was riding in the bazaar his herald said to him o guru behold the mohammedans praying the mohammedans overheard this and believing that he ridiculed their religion reported to the emperor that under a mohammedan administration the sikhs were mocking the faithful the emperor at the instigation of the quazis ordered ajit singh to cut off his hair and appear thus humbled before him if he failed in this the emperor reserved to himself the right to punish him as he thought fit ajit singh fearing death cut off his hair and grovelled before the emperor mata sandari was enraged on hearing of this act of apostasy and told him never again to show her his face she drew up a document to the effect that though she had adopted and cherished ajit singh as a son she now renounced him she then entrusted guru har gobind's arms to the faithful sikhs of dihli and expressed her desire to live no longer in such an evil and ill-omened city the sikhs however prevailed on her to alter her determination ajit singh 
now abandoned by the sikhs went to beg at mata sundari's door she sent him money but would never consent to see him a muhammadan fakir on whom ajit singh when in good circumstances used to bestow money one day met him in the dili bazaar and asked for alms ajit singh in his poverty could only give him a few copper coins the fakir was not satisfied but followed him to his house and further importuned him he would not leave but dogged his steps as he went shooting during the afternoon ajit singh complained to his servants of the annoyance the beggar was causing him whereupon they beat the man so severely that he died they disposed of his body by throwing it into a well for the purpose of concealment the fakir's fate gradually became known and the emperor ordered ajit singh to be arrested and brought before him ajit singh refused to obey the order and put himself in a posture of defence his house was besieged and his adherents fought bravely to protect him he contrived to send his wife and son hathi singh both disguised in soiled clothes to mata sundari he then succeeded in escaping from his house and concealed himself in a straw stack belonging to hindus who lived near the owner of the stack discovered him and on hearing that a proclamation had been issued for his arrest informed the authorities ajit singh was seized tied to an elephant's tail and dragged through the city at a turning in one of the streets the elephant trod on his head upon which his brains oozed out mata sundari thinking her position unsafe in dili on account of having received ajit singh's wife and son put into execution her long-cherished project of abandoning that city and proceeded with her charge to bhagatgarh the headman of, of the place would not allow her through fear of the emperor to remain in his city she thence went to mathura where she was received with great distinction the governor of the city induced the raja of jaipur to grant her the revenue of two villages and also a suitable place of residence in mathura hathi singh grew up to manhood adopted his father's style and maintained a retinue of sixty mounted orderlies he tried to compose hymns but inspiration failed him he then abstracted some from the granth sahib and wherever the name nanak occurred inserted his own mata sundari on being informed of this became very wroth abandoned hathi singh and his mother at mathura and returned to dihli during the invasion of ahmad shah hathi singh fled from mathura to burhanpur where he subsequently died leaving no male issue when mata sundari arrived in dihli she by the kind offices of raja ram the emperor's minister obtained possession of her house and property which had been seized by the muhammadans after her departure she spent the remainder of her days there and died in comparative worldly comfort in sambat eighteen hundred and four a d seventeen hundred and forty seven her body was cremated near the shrine of guru har krishan it will be remembered that when the guru evacuated anandpur he sent gulab rai and sham singh with a letter to the raja of nahan requesting him to grant them the means of subsistence the raja gave them two villages gulab rai afterwards purchased anandpur for sixty thousand rupees from the kalur raja and returned to live there he caused himself to be worshipped by the sikhs and carried his unseemly pretensions so far as to actually install himself in the guru's seat sadhu gur baksh who had been an attendant on the guru and had by him been left in charge of guru teg bahadur's shrine remonstrated against the usurpation whereupon gulab rai became very angry and addressed him in offensive language gur baksh then cursed him saying thou and thy line shall perish in a short time gulab rai and his two sons died 
after that gulab rai's widow took the offerings of the sikhs and remained in possession of anandpur when she was on the point of death she appointed sir john singh sham singh's son now old and experienced as heir of anandpur his descendants still occupy that city and receive a yearly revenue from the indian government and the sikh states a sikh writer called gurdas who lived long after the time of guru gobind singh wrote a war in his praise which the sikhs appended to the compositions of bai gur das and which now appears as the forty-first war the following paris are extracted from it pari fifteen guru gobind was manifested as the tenth avatar he repeated the name of the creator who is unseen eternal and stainless he established the khalsa a sect of his own and gave it great glory wearing long hair he grasped the sword and smote all his enemies he put on the kach of continents and practised arms he established the sikh war cry and was victorious in mighty battles he caused all demon enemies to be surrounded and trampled upon then his endless praise was gradually proclaimed throughout the world thus arose the race of singhs who wore blue clothes who killed all the hostile turks and repeated god's name no one could withstand them so the turkish leaders decamped rajas kings and amirs all became the dust beneath the singhs feet great hills trembled when they heard their victorious drums there was then great commotion throughout the whole world the enemy abandoned their homes and perished in the great confusion and trouble that ensued there is none so great a destroyer of fear as the true guru he handled and displayed such a sword as none could withstand well done well done gobind singh thou wert at once guru and disciple pari sixteen by the order of the immortal god the great guru obtained inspiration then he gradually established the khalsa whole-bodied and manly then arose the roaring of the singhs lions which terrified the whole world they levelled with the earth the shrines of hindus and mohammedans they cancelled the veds the purans the six hindu systems and the koran they abolished the call to prayer and the prayer carpet of the mohammedans and killed the turkish monarchs temporal and spiritual leaders all hid themselves or became converted to sikhism the mullahs and the qazis grew weary of reading but found not god's secret hundreds of thousands of pandits brahmans and astrologers have become entangled in worldly affairs worshipping stones and temples they had become exceedingly superstitious both the hindus and the mohammedans were altogether engaged in deception consequently a third religion the khalsa arose and became renowned the singhs by the order of guru gobind singh seized the sword and wielded it they killed all their enemies and caused the name of the immortal god to be repeated then god's order was promulgated in the world the drum of victory resounded and drowned the cry of sorrow the great sagacious guru established a third sect well done well done gobind singh thou wert at once guru and disciple End of life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty three section thirty four of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from al kal ustat in the year a d seventeen hundred and thirty four while in amritsar by mani singh compiled the compositions and translations of guru gobind singh and of the bards who were associated with him the compilation was subsequently known as the granth of the tenth guru though mani singh did not give it that title 
we now proceed to give translations from it of such doctrinal and historical portions as we believe to represent the guru's own opinions and acts Jop, there is one god the true the great and the bounteous the tenth guru spoke with his holy mouth god hath no quoit or marks no colour no caste no lineage no form no complexion no outline no costume none can in any way describe him he is immovable fearless luminous and measureless in might he is accounted king of kings lord of millions of indars he is sovereign of the three worlds demigods men and demons the woods and dales declare him indescribable o lord who can tell all thy names the wise call thee special names according to thy deeds i call ustat praise of the immortal may we have the protection of the immortal being may we have the protection of all steel may we have the protection of all death may we have the protection of all steel i bow to the one primal god who extended sea and land and nether regions and the firmament he is the primal being unseen and immortal his light is manifest in the fourteen worlds he is contained in the ant as in the elephant he deemeth the rich and the poor alike he is unequalled unseen and eternal he is the searcher of all hearts he is invisible indestructible and without distinguishing dress he is without passion colour form or outline he is devoid of caste marks of every kind he is the primal being peerless and changeless he hath no enemy no friend no father no mother he is far from all and near all his dwelling is in sea and land and nether and upper regions boundless is his form and boundless his voice in the shelter of his feet dwelleth bawani brahma and vishnu have not found his limits the four-faced brahma pointeth out that god is indescribable he made millions of indars and bawans he created and destroyed brahmas and sheaves the fourteen worlds he made as a play and again blended them with himself he made endless demons deities serpents celestial singers yakshas excellent and beautiful he is spoken of in the past the future and the present and he knoweth the secrets of every heart he is not attached to any one love he is contained in the light of all souls he recognizeth all people in all places he is free from death and immortal he is the invisible imperceptible being distinct from all the world he is immortal and decaying imperishable and of changeless purpose he is the destroyer and creator of all he is the remover of sickness sorrow and sin he who with single heart meditateth on him even for a moment shall not fall into death's noose thou art without sorrow without form yet beautiful the king of kings the giver of great gifts the preserver of life the giver of milk and sons the remover of sickness and sorrow sometimes honourable and inspiring great honour thou art a student of science an unrivalled incarnation thou appearest as a cid thou art the glory of purity thou art the net of youth the death of death the torment of enemies the life of friends the following ten sawayas or quatrains are recited at the administration of the pahal or baptism according to the rites of the tenth guru one i have wandered and in their own homes seen crowds of saravajis sudes seeds yogis and yadis brave demons demigods feasting on nectar and crowds of saints of various sects i have seen the religions of all countries but none appeared to be that of the lord of life without a particle of the love and favour of god they are only worth a rati two emperors before whom strong-armed kings used to lowly bow their heads in countless numbers who possess proud elephants with golden trappings incomparable tall painted with bright colours millions of horses which bounded like deer 
and were fleeter than the wind what mattered it how great those emperors were they at last departed barefooted three though they roamed and conquered all countries beating their various drums though many beautiful elephants trumpeted loud and thousands of horses of royal breed neighed for them who can number such kings in the past the future and the present they cannot be counted yet without worshipping the name of god the lord of wealth they went at last to their final home four men bathe at places of pilgrimage exercise mercy curb their passions bestow gifts exercise abstinence and perform various special ceremonies the veds the parans the koran and the other books of the mussulmans the earth and heaven all have i seen thousands of fasters yatis who practise continence all have i carefully observed yet without worshipping the name of the one god and loving him even kings are of no account five trained soldiers powerful irresistible well accoutred with coats of mail crush their enemies filled with high martial spirit they would put mountains to flight themselves unshaken they would shatter their enemies destroy rebels crush the pride of furious elephants yet without the favour of god the lord of wealth they should all depart at last and leave the world six countless heroes very valiant without hesitation face the edge of the sword subdue countries crush rebels and the pride of furious elephants break powerful forts and even without fighting conquer in every direction but their efforts avail not the lord is the commander of them all the suppliants are many while there is but one giver seven even the demons gods serpents and ghosts who repeat god's name in the past future and present all the beings which in sea and land every moment set up god in their hearts shall find their good deeds and glory increase they shall hear the voices of gratulation and the multitude of their sins shall depart the congregations of saints wander happy in the world all their enemies on beholding them are cowed eight lords of men and elephants rulers who reign in the three worlds who perform millions of ablutions make gifts of elephants and other animals and marry brides at various splendid swayamvars they with brahma shiv vishnu and indar shall at last be entangled and fall into death's noose but they who touch the feet of the lord of wealth shall not again resume a body nine what availeth it to sit closing both eyes and meditating like a crane this world is lost and the next also for those who go about bathing in the seven seas they pass their lives in vain dwelling in the midst of sin i speak verily hear me all ye people they who love god have obtained him ten some worshipping stones put them on their heads some suspend lingams from their necks some see god in the south some bow their heads to the west some fools worship idols others busy themselves with worshipping the dead the whole world entangled in false ceremonies hath not found god's secret god is not subject to birth or death he is acquainted with the excellent fourteen sciences he is without stain and infinite he is of unfading brightness and generous his form is not quickly recognized he is head of the saints of the whole world he is the highest object of praise by him the earth and sun are supported he is the treasury of the eighteen supernatural powers he is the dispeller of sorrow in all the worlds he is not subject to time to death or to karma he is versed in all religious ceremonies his glory is infrangible and unequalled he established all establishment he is without sorrow indivisible and impenetrable 
brahma by his four veds sings his praises the veds speak of him as indescribable brahma speaks of him as endless his glory is unknowable and unequalled indivisible immeasurable and unestablished by any one he made the extension of the world he created it with the utmost thought his form is endless and infrangible his glory is peerless and dazzling he is invisible and noble he made millions of indars and kings many brahmas and vishnus who meditate on him many rams krishans and prophets no one is acceptable without devotion there are many oceans mountains great as bind many fishes tortoises and serpents many deities and sons of brahma many incarnations of krishan and vishnu many indars to sweep before his door many veds and brahmas many rudars and bawans and many unequalled rams and krishans many men recite amatory poetry many tell the secrets of the veds many recite the shastars and simritis and some read the purans many perform fire sacrifices many painful penances with bodies reversed many lift their arms in the fashion of the sannyasis some down the garb of yogis and abandon the world some perform the niwali feat some practise painful fasting some go on pilgrimages and give boundless alms some are generous in their worldly acts some perform unequal burnt offerings some obtain regal state and dispense justice some act according to the shastars and the simritis and some in opposition to the veds many wander in different countries and many remain fixed in one place some pray in water some endure five fires on their bodies some dwell in the forest some perform the endless duties of a family man some are generous in the fashion of kings some are free from sickness and error some perform good and others bad acts some pose as shaikhs others as brahmans some perform the duties of kings in an incomparable manner some are free from bodily and mental suffering some are subject to the service of a special god some are poor others the sons of kings and some are the incarnations of vayas many brahmas read the vedas and many shesnags repeat god's name some are bhairagis others sannyasis and some wander in the guise of udasis know that all these things are vain and that all such religion is fruitless without the support of the one name deem all religious ceremonies as superstition god is in the water god is in the dry land god is in the heart god is in the forest god is in the mountain god is in the cave god is in the earth god is in heaven god is here god is there god is in space god is in time god is invisible god is without a garb god is without sin god is without enmity god is deathless god is uncherished god is impenetrable god is invulnerable god is not moved by charms or spells god has his own light he cannot be moved by incantations god is without caste god is without lineage god is without friends god hath no mother god feeleth no physical or mental suffering god is without doubt god hath no karma god is invincible god is fearless god is infrangible god is indissoluble god cannot be punished god is radiant god is transcendent god is inscrutable repeat god's name establish god's name in thy heart do penance unto god and repeat his name thou o god art in the water thou art in the dry land thou art in the river thou art in the sea thou art in the tree thou art in its leaves thou art in the earth thou art in the firmament thy name is repeated again and again thy name is fixed in man's heart thou art space thou art time thou art the occupant thou art the place thou art unborn thou art fearless thou art impalpable thou art indestructible thou art continence thou art fasting thou art deliverance thou art wisdom thou alone art thou alone art the following is a satire on various penances and austerities practised by hindu sects in india swine eat filth elephants and donkeys bespatter themselves with dust jackals live at places of cremation 
owls live in tombs deer wander alone in the forest trees ever die in silence the man who restraineth his seed should only have the credit of the hermaphrodite monkeys ever wander barefooted how shall the wretch who is subject to a woman and devoted to lust and wrath be saved without the knowledge of the one god it is known that demons live in the forest all children on earth drink milk and serpents live on air they who eat grass and renounce the desire of wealth are no more than calves and oxen they who fly in the heavens have only the attribute of birds they who engage in meditation resemble cranes cats and wolves all great guianes who knew but asserted not themselves never allowed such deceit as the above to enter their hearts even by mistake they who live in the earth should be called the offspring of worms they who live in the heavens should be called birds they who eat fruit should be called the offspring of monkeys they who wander unseen should be accounted as ghosts they who float on water are like ganjeris they who eat fire like chakors they who worship the sun have the attribute of the lotus they who worship the moon of water lilies the tortoise the fish and the shark may all be called narayan if you speak of god as kal nab the lake in which there is lotus is also kal nab if you speak of god as gopanath all gujars are gopanaths all cowherds gopals if you call god rikikesh that is a name taken by superiors of religious orders if you call god madhav that is the bumblebee kanaya is the name of the woodpecker if you speak of god as a destroyer of khans you speak of the myrmidons of death fools utter names but know not their meanings and worship not him by whom man is protected god is the protector and destroyer of the world compassionate to the poor punisher of enemies ever the cherisher and free from death's noose yogis wearers of matted hair celibates the true great brahmacharis who undergo hunger and thirst in their divine meditation they who perform the niwali feat who sacrifice to water fire and wind who hold their heads down who stand on one leg and never sit men serpents deities and demons find not god's secrets the veds and the books of the mussulman say that god is indescribable peacocks skip about dancing the thunder roareth and the lightning presenteth many phases if god be obtained by being cold or hot there is nothing colder than the moon nothing hotter than the sun if by being a raja god may be obtained there is no king equal to indar who filleth the whole world nowhere can be found a penitent like a shiv a reader of the veds like primal brahma or penitents like the sons of brahma yet without divine knowledge they are all subject to the noose of death and ever wander through the cycle of the ages one chief was born one died and one was born again there have also been many incarnations of ram chandar and krishan how many brahmas and vishnus have there been how many veds and purans how many collections of simratis have been and passed away how many preachers and madars how many casters and pollaxes how many ansavatars have succumbed to death how many priests and prophets have there been they are so many that they cannot be counted from dust they sprang and to dust they returned yogis yatis brahmacharis and very great kings the shadow of whose umbrellas extended for many miles who wandered subduing kingdoms and crushing the pride of very great kings sovereigns like man and lords of the umbrella like dilip great kings who prided themselves on the strength of their arms proud men like dara like the kings of dili and like durjadhan having enjoyed the earth in their turn at last were blended with it artillerymen huntsmen wearing decoy dresses and they who eat opium bow their heads many times what availeth it that men perform prostrations of different kinds to god they are like wrestlers practising the exercise of dand what availeth it that men lie with their faces turned up if they do not heartily bow to the supreme god they are only as sick men how can he who is the slave of worldly desires and ever clever in obtaining wealth obtain the one lord of the world without faith in him he into whose ear an earwig hath entered shaketh his head he who hath lost a friend or son beateth his head in mourning 
for grazing on ak eating fruits and flowers and ever wandering in the forests there is no animal like a goat what if a sheep rub its head against trees and thus take off its hair as for eating earth call the leech and ask it how can he who is a slave to worldly desires and addicted to lust and wrath find god without faith the peacocks dance the frogs croak and the clouds ever thunder the tree ever standeth on one leg in the forest as for those who take not life the saravaji bloweth on the ground before putting his feet on it the stones through several ages remain in one place the ravens and the kites travel from country to country how can the wretch who is without divine knowledge and who is never absorbed in the great benefactor be saved without faith in him like an actor man sometimes poseth as a yogi or bairagi sometimes he assumeth the guise of a sannyasi sometimes he appeareth to live on air sometimes he sitteth in an attitude of contemplation sometimes in his infatuation for pelf he singeth many praises of men sometimes he is a brahmachari sometimes he produceth a garden in his hand sometimes he holdeth a fakir's staff and deceiveth men's senses he who is subject to worldly desires danceth with gestures but being devoid of divine knowledge how shall he obtain heaven in the cold season the jackal barketh five times and the elephant and the donkey utter various cries what availeth it to be cut in twain by the saw at benares thieves cut men in pieces and kill them with axes what availeth it that a fool hath put a halter round his neck and drowned himself in the ganges thags put men to death by putting halters round their necks without meditation on divine knowledge fools are drowned in hell's river and without faith how can there be any such meditation if any one were to obtain by penance the lord who suffereth not pain the wounded man suffereth pain of many kinds if any one were by repeating god's name to obtain god who cannot be obtained by lip-worship the warbler ever uttereth too high too high if any one were to obtain god by flying in the heavens the bird called and wandereth in the firmament if salvation be obtained by burning oneself in the fire why should not the sati and also the serpent which liveth in hell be saved the following is a homily on the equality of men and on the hindu and mohammedan forms of worship one man by shaving his head is accepted as a sannyasi another as a yogi or a brahmachari a third as a yati some men are hindus and others mussulmans among the latter are rafazis imams and shafais know that all men are of the same caste karta the creator and karim the beneficent are the same razak the provider and rahim the merciful are the same let no man even by mistake suppose there is a difference worship the one god who is the one divine guru for all know that his form is one and that he is the one light diffused in all the temple and the mosque are the same the hindu worship and the mussulman prayer are the same all men are the same it is through error they appear different deities demons yakshas heavenly singers mussulmans and hindus adopt the customary dress of their different countries all men have the same eyes the same ears the same body the same build a compound of earth air fire and water allah and abhek are the same the purans and the koran are the same they are all alike it is the one god who created all the following gives the sikh conception of the manner in which souls emanated from god and are again absorbed in him as from one fire millions of sparks arise though rising separately they unite again in the fire as from one heap of dust several particles of dust fill the air and on filling it again blend with the dust as in one stream millions of waves are produced the waves being made of water all become water so from god's form non-sentient and sentient things are manifested and springing from him shall all be united in him again how many tortoises and fishes and how many eaters of them how many excellent young animals become strong-winged and fly how many birds of prey in the firmament eat the excellent birds and how many animals eat and digest the birds of prey when they see them what mattereth it whether things live in water or land or fly in the firmament god made them and will destroy them all 
as light blendeth with darkness and darkness with light so all things have sprung from god and shall be united in him how many go about howling how many die weeping how many are drowned in the water how many are burnt in the fire how many dwell by the ganges how many in medina and maka how many wander as anchorets how many undergo the pain of being cut by the saw how many of burying themselves in the earth how many of being impaled how many fly in the firmament how many dwell in water but they shall all be burnt in the fire for want of divine knowledge the demigods have grown weary searching for god the archdemons have grown weary striving with him the wise have grown weary exercising their wisdom they who repeat his name have grown weary of watching men have grown weary of grinding and applying sandal to themselves they have grown weary of applying excellent attar of roses they have grown weary of worshipping stones and offering them pudding they have grown weary of visiting cemeteries and yogis places of burial they have grown weary of smearing walls and of being marked with the brand of idols the celestial musicians have grown weary of singing all the canars have grown weary of their penance but none of them have found god the following is guru gobind singh's conception of the divinity god is without passion without colour without form without outline he is without worldly love without anger without enmity without jealousy he is without karma without error without birth and without caste he hath no friend no enemy no father no mother he hath no worldly love no house no desires no home he hath no son no friend no enemy no wife he is invisible without distinguishing dress and unborn he is ever the bestower of supernatural power and wisdom he is of size beyond measure his form and outline cannot be known nor where he dwelleth nor in what disguises he wandereth nor what his name is nor what he is called how shall i describe him he cannot be described he hath no disease or sorrow or worldly love or mother no karma no superstition no birth no caste he hath no jealousy no garb and is unborn i bow to him as one i bow to him as one he is beyond all things and from the beginning the dispenser of wisdom he is indivisible indestructible primal peerless and imperishable he hath no caste or lineage or form or colour i bow to the primal and infrangible one how many millions of worms like krishan he created built fashioned again destroyed and created he is unfathomable fearless primal unrivalled imperishable he is beyond all things from the beginning and perfect in his splendour he feeleth nor mental nor bodily pain he is unfathomable his glory is infrangible he is from the beginning and his majesty is indestructible he hath no birth no death no caste no pain he is infrangible radiant unamercible impossible to be controlled he hath no worldly love no home he hath affection for men and is his own master he is powerful cannot be anywhere contained radiant the torturer of enemies he cannot be depicted in the past the present or the future he is not rich or poor he hath no form or outline he feeleth not covetousness or mental anxiety he is not formed out of the elements he belongeth to no sect he hath no enemy no friend no worldly love no home he is eternal and ever contained in all things he beareth love to all he hath no lust no wrath no avarice no worldly love he is unborn indestructible primal peerless invisible he is not subject to birth or death he hath no caste nor pain he hath no sickness no sorrow he is fearless and without affliction he is impenetrable indivisible without karma and without death he cannot be destroyed or defamed he is bright and without a cherisher he hath no father no mother no caste no body he hath no worldly love no home no doubt no fear he hath no form there is no king over him he hath no body no acts attached to him he hath no fear he cannot be killed or pierced he hath no doubts he is eternal ever present and of size beyond measure i bow to him as one i bow to him as one his glory is inexpressible he is from the beginning he is unassociated imperishable imperceptible and unestablished i bow to him as one i bow to him as one he hath no worldly love no home no grief no relation he is afar off pure undefiled none can behold him he hath no caste no lineage no friend no minister i bow to the one independent being i bow to the one independent being he hath no religion no superstition no shame no relation no armour no shield no karma no fear no enemy no friends no son i bow to the primal being i bow to the primal being 
the bodies of some undergo cold heat and rain some sit in one posture for an age some make efforts to study the science of yog men strive but even then find not god's limits some with their arms raised wander in different countries some scorch themselves between the sun and surrounding fires some recite the simratis the shastars the veds some expound amorous poetry others the books of the mohammedans some perform fire sacrifice some live on air some millions eat carrion some consume vegetables some milk some leaves but even so god becometh not manifest unto them the following sawayas also are sometimes read at the administration of the pahul one god ever cherisheth the poor saveth saints and destroyeth enemies birds beasts mountains snakes and kings all he ever cherisheth he cherisheth animals in sea and land he considereth not their evil acts compassionate to the poor an ocean of mercy he beholdeth man's sins but wearieth not of giving two he destroyeth misery and sin he crusheth an army of evil men in a moment he breaketh those unbreakable by human power he smiteth the very valiant but cherisheth love for those who truly love him vishnu the lord of lakshmi cannot find his limit the vedas and the books of the mussulmans cannot utter his secret the beneficent one ever beholdeth men's secrets yet he becometh not angry and withholdeth not their daily bread three he made worms moths deer serpents the past the future and the present the demigods and demons were ruined through their pride they knew not god's secret and were led astray by error the veds the purans the koran and other mohammedan books have grown weary of taking god's account but they have not found it without the light of true love hath any one obtained the honour of finding god for he is primal endless unfathomable without enmity and fearless in the past future and present he is without end one out of many without blemish sin or stain and indestructible he is the creator and destroyer of worlds he supporteth life on sea and land compassionate to the poor a mind of mercy beautiful is the holy lord of wealth five he hath not lust or wrath or covetousness or worldly love or sickness or sorrow or enjoyment or fear he is without a body he beareth love to all yet is he devoid of sensual love he is homeless and indestructible to those who know him he giveth to those who know him not he also giveth he giveth to the earth he giveth to the heavens o man why waverest thou the beautiful and holy lord of wealth will care for thee six he preserveth men in many ways from sickness from sorrow from water and from sprites when enemies aim blows at us none of them may reach our bodies for he holdeth out his hand to protect us and hinder the army of sin from approaching us what else need i say to thee o man god protecteth thee with the screen of the womb seven the yakshas serpents demons demigods all meditate on thee the inscrutable one on earth in heaven and in the nether regions of hell yakshas serpents all bow their heads unto thee but they cannot find the limit of thy glory the veds describe thee as indescribable all the demigods who search for thee have grown weary of their search they have not found thee o god eight beings like narad brahma ramna the rikhi all combine to sing thy praises the veds and the books of the mussulmans have not found thy secret all have grown weary in their search god hath not been found by any one shiv the lord of yuma cannot find thy limit the sids with their spiritual leaders and the sons of brahma meditate on thee o men meditate in your hearts on him whose immeasurable power is diffused throughout the whole world nine the veds the purans the koran and other mussulman books have not found his secret all kings have grown sore weary searching for it they could not find the secret of the inscrutable after great travail they proclaimed him invulnerable thou o lord hast no passion no form no outline no colour no relation no sorrow no companion thou wast in the beginning and yet hadst no beginning thou art unfathomable without distinguishing dress and without jealousy he who repeateth thy name shall save his relations ten men have performed millions of ablutions at places of pilgrimage they have made many offerings and endured great fasts putting on the dress of great penitence and wearing long hair they have wandered in many countries but they have not found the beloved god 
they have made millions of attitudes of contemplation and prostrations many offerings of their limbs to tutelary divinities and blackened their faces but without meditating on the name of the compassionate to the poor the deathless they have at last gone to death's abode thou art the discharger of arms the holder of the earth and the umbrella the betrayer of kings the great tormentor of enemies the bestower of gifts the great enhancer of honour the giver of a resting-place the cutter of death's noose conqueror in the fight remover of obstacles great bestower of wisdom thou art honoured even among the most honoured thou art learned in divine knowledge thou art the great giver of wisdom the destroyer of the god of death the dwellers of the east know not thy limit the goddess hingula who dwelleth in the himalayas meditateth on thee the gur disease of gore sing the praises of thy name the yogis practise yog to be united with thee how many suspend their breath to obtain thee the arabs of arabia worship thy name the Farangis of france worship thee the kandaris and Quarishis know thee the residents of the west recognize thee as the object of their love the marathas and the magadis heartily do thee penance the natives of telang fix thee in their hearts and recognize thee as the abode of religion like milk in chirwad like buttermilk in chatranir like moonlight on the banks of the jamna like a female swan in turkey of the shias like a diamond in husainabad like the stream of the ganges when it blendeth with the seven seas like quicksilver in palagar like silver in rampur like saltpetre in surangabad like the champa flower in chandarikat like moonlight in chandagar thy praise flourisheth like the malati flower like christu and kailas kamagar and kashipur like a mirror in sarangabad like snow in the himalayas like shiv's necklace in halbanir like a swan in hajipur on seeing which the heart is fascinated like white sandal in champawati like the moon in chandrajir like moonlight in chandagar like the ganges on shiv's head like cranes in bulandabad shineth the light of thy praises the persians the english the double-faced men of france the mirdang players of makran sing thy praises the inhabitants of bakar of kandhar and of gore and the gakars and gurdzis and those who live in on air meditate on thy name in the east in palau in kamrap and kaman wherever man goeth there thou presidest thy glory is perfect written and spoken incantations cannot affect thee o lord and none can find the limit of thy praises god is peerless imperishable his throne is immovable he is peerless endless his praise is unrivalled he is indestructible and the invisible lord he is everywhere king he blossometh in the forest and the glades his splendour is like the spring everywhere diffused the great one pervadeth the woods and glades birds and quadrupeds he everywhere blossometh he is beautiful and wise he blossometh like flowers and glittereth like the peacock cupid on recognising him waveth a chari over him his power is perfect he is the bestower of food the merciful the treasury of favour the perfect the bounteous wherever we look there appeareth his splendour he is free from anger and a treasury of favour he everywhere blossometh he is beautiful and wise he is the great king of the woods and glades of sea and land his splendour appeareth everywhere he is the treasury of favour his light dazzleth his glory is perfect the sky and the earth repeat his name over the seven heavens and the seven hells his net of karma is spread unseen end of compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from akal ustat section thirty five of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from vichita natak one guru gobind singh addresses god as a sword to destroy his enemies i bow with love and devotion to the holy sword assist me that i may complete this work thou art the subduer of countries the destroyer of the armies of the wicked in the battle-field thou greatly adornest the brave thine arm is infrangible thy brightness refulgent thy radiance and splendour dazzle like the sun 
thou bestowest happiness on the good thou terrifiest the evil thou scatterest sinners i seek thy protection hail hail to the creator of the world the saviour of creation my cherisher hail to thee o sword i bow to him who holdeth the arrow in his hand i bow to the fearless one i bow to the god of gods who is in the present and the future i bow to the scimitar the two-edged sword the falchion and the dagger thou o god hast ever one form thou art ever unchangeable i bow to the holder of the mace who diffused light through the fourteen worlds i bow to the arrow and the musket i bow to the sword spotless fearless and unbreakable i bow to the powerful mace and lance to which nothing is equal i bow to him who holdeth the discus who is not made of the elements and who is terrible i bow to him with the strong teeth i bow to him who is supremely powerful i bow to the arrow and the cannon which destroy the enemy i bow to the sword and the rapier which destroy the evil i bow to all weapons called shastar which may be held i bow to all weapons called astar which may be hurled or discharged thou turnest men like me from blades of grass into mountains then thou there is none other cherisher of the poor o god do thou thyself pardon mine errors there is none who hath erred like me the houses of those who have served thee are all seen filled with wealth in this cow age and at all times there is great confidence in the powerful arm of the sword which in one moment destroyed millions of demons like sumbd and nisumb which in an instant subdued demons such as dumarlakan chand mand and mahik which in a trice repelled demons such as chamar ranchichar and rekachichan which careth thy slave since he hath found a good lord like thee which crushed millions like mund madhu kitab mur and og they who never sought shelter in the battlefield and who retreated not even two paces when blows were dealt around them the demons who could not be drowned in the sea and who could not be burnt by fiery arrows on beholding thy flash o sword cast aside shame and fled thou in a moment didst destroy such heroes as rawan maharawan kumbakaran meganand and akampan in waging war with whom even death grew wearied kumb akumb who having conquered the whole world washed their arms in the seven seas they who were invulnerable and huge were all wounded and killed by the sword in the hand of god if any one flee to save himself from the destroyer say in what direction shall he flee can man run away from god who stoppeth him with a drawn sword thundering and brandishing it no contrivance hath been made by which man may escape from the wound god inflicteth why o fool seekest thou not cheerfully the asylum of him from whom thou canst not escape thou hast millions of times repeated the names of krishan and vishnu and fully meditated on ram chandar and the prophet thou hast repeated brahma's name and established shiv in thy heart but none of them will save thee thou hast performed millions of penances for millions of days but none of them will avail thee a kauri incantations to obtain thy desires will not be worth thee hath a paisa none of them will save thee from the stroke of death why performest thou false penance to the gods it will not avail thee a kauri how can they save thee when they cannot protect themselves from the stroke of death they will suspend thee in the fiery pit of terrible wrath as they are suspended themselves think think even to-day in thy heart o fool without the favour of god nothing can avail thee it is not by the practice of perpetual silence nor by the ostensible relinquishment of pride nor by the adoption of a religious dress nor by shaving the head nor by wearing a wooden necklace nor by twisting matted hair round the head 
that god is found i speak the truth hear it attentively without entering the protection of the compassionate to the poor and loving him can god be found the merciful one is not pleased with circumcision were i to make all the islands my paper and the seven seas my ink were i to cut down all trees and turn them into pens for writing were i to make saraswati dictate for millions of ages were i to write with the hand of ganesh o thou who holdest the destroying sword i could not please thee even a little without offering thee homage to thy greatness is endless and boundless no one hath found its limits thou art god of gods king of kings compassionate to poor and cherisher of the lowly the dumb would recite the six shastars cripples would climb mountains the blind would see and the deaf hear if god would only show favour how can my feeble intellect o god describe thy greatness i cannot utter thy praises do thou correct this work how far can this worm speak it is only thou o god who knowest thine own praises as a son knoweth not the time of his father's birth how can i tell thy secret thy greatness becometh thee it cannot be described by others thou knowest thine own works o god how shall high or low describe thee Shesh nag whom thou didst create with a thousand heads whom two thousand tongues adorn until now is uttering thy boundless names yet even still he cannot find their limit how far can any one describe thy works the intellect is perplexed in trying to understand them thy subtle form cannot be described i shall describe thy great form when i have obtained thy love and service then shall i put aside all other narratives and describe thee i shall now relate my own history and how the sati family originated at first when god extended himself the world was created by him the man who doeth good deeds is called a demigod in the world he who doeth bad deeds in the world is styled a demon kaul sin was the first king his strength and form were unsurpassed incomparable and unrivalled kalket was the second king Quir Baras was appointed the third king in the world kald hudj was the fourth king who graced sovereignty in this line raghu was born from whom the raghu race was descended from them an excellent son aj was born a great charioteer and archer when he assumed the garb of a yogi he bestowed his empire and throne on dasaroth who also became a great archer he felt desire and married three wives his first son was the prince ram the second bharat the third lachman and the fourth shat rugan they ruled for a long time they then died and went to heaven sita's sons lahu and kushu afterwards both became kings and graced kingdoms and thrones on their marriage with the daughters of the king of the Punjab, they performed various sacrifices they built their two cities one kasur the second lahaur lahore both became very famous salan and amrawati the city of indar became ashamed on beholding them kushu and lahu reigned for a long time but were at length caught in the noose of death their sons and grandsons also ruled in this world how far shall i tell their history i cannot even recount their names it is related that kalket and kalrai had innumerable sons in their homes kalket possessed peerless strength and expelled kalrai from the city he fled to the sanaut country where he married a king's daughter the son born in his house of that marriage he named sadhi rai the sadhi race began from that time it was made by the supremely pure creator the sons and grandsons who sprang from sadi rai were all called sadis in this world they became very distinguished among men and their wealth increased day by day they exercised independent sway and conquered the kings of many countries they enforced religion everywhere caused umbrellas to wave over their heads and on many occasions performed sacrifices at royal coronations afterwards dissension arose among them and no holy man could arrest its progress heroes and invincible warriors went about carapacened took arms and went to fight in the field of battle 
for wealth and land ancient is the struggle to compass which men willingly die worldly love and pride have extended quarrels lust and wrath have conquered the whole world nobody can compute the time when enmity dissension and pride were diffused in this world their basis is greed by the desire for which every one killeth himself three the saudis returned to the punjab and waged war with the descendants of kushu who had been left behind the descendants of kushu being defeated fled to benares where they became readers of the veds four those of the expelled descendants of kushu who read the veds were called bedis they carefully attended to their religious duties the king of the punjab dispatched them a conciliatory letter to forget the enmity that prevailed among them the raja's messenger arrived in banaras and explained the contents of the missive to all the bedis upon this all the readers of the veds proceeded to the punjab and on their arrival made obeisance to the king he caused them to recite the veds while all his brethren were seated near him in the assembly they recited the sam ved the yajur ved then the rig ved making gesticulations with their hands and finally the athara ved the raja was pleased and gave them all his possessions he elected to live in the forest to remove his great sins on giving them his kingdom he assumed the garb of a ricky the people tried to restrain him but he dismissed all regret and relinquishing wealth and place became absorbed in god's love the bedi chief was pleased on obtaining the kingdom and in the joy of his heart blessed the saadi king saying when i come in the kal age under the name of nanak i will make thee worthy of worship in the world and thou shalt attain the highest dignity thou hast heard the three beds from us on hearing the fourth bed thou gavest thy territory having assumed three births in my fourth i will make thee guru on the one hand the saadi king went to the forest on the other the bedi king was happy in his sovereignty how far shall i amplify this story i very much fear to swell my book five afterwards again quarrels increased among the bedis which no one could adjust it was the will of god that sovereignty should pass from their family only twenty villages remained to the bedis which they began to till a long time passed in that way until the epoch of the birth of nanak arrived nanak rai born in the line of those bedis conferred happiness on all his disciples and assisted them in this world and the next he established religion in the kal age and showed the way unto all holy men sin never troubleth those who follow in his footsteps god removeth all suffering and sin from those who embrace his religion pain and hunger never annoy them and they never fall into death's noose nanak assumed the body of angad and made his religion current in the world afterwards nanak was called amar das as one lamp is lit from another when the time for the fulfilment of the blessing came then ram das sadi became guru amar das gave him the guruship according to the ancient blessing and took the road to paradise himself the holy nanak was revered as angad angad was recognized as amar das and amar das became ram das the pious saw this but not the fools who thought them all distinct but some rare person recognized that they were all one they who understood this obtained perfection without understanding perfection cannot be obtained when ram das was blended with god he gave the guruship to arjan when arjan was going to god's city he appointed har gobind in his place when har gobind was going to god's city he seated har rai in his place har grishan his son afterwards became guru after him came teg bahadur who protected the frontal marks and sacrificial threads of the hindus and displayed great bravery in the cow age when he put an end to his life for the sake of holy men he gave his head but uttered not a groan he suffered martyrdom for the sake of his religion he gave his head but swerved not from his determination god's people would be ashamed to perform the tricks of mountebanks and cheats 
having broken his potsherd on the head of the king of dihli he departed to paradise none came into the world who performed such deeds as he at his departure there was mourning in this world there was grief through the world but joy in paradise six guru gobind singh now speaks regarding himself i shall now tell my own history how god brought me into the world as i was performing penance on the mountain of hem kunt where the seven peaks are conspicuous the place is called the sapt shring where king pandu practised yag there i performed very great austerities and worshipped great death i performed such penance that i became blended with god my father and mother had also worshipped the unseen one and strove in many ways to unite themselves with him the supreme guru was pleased with their devotion to him when god gave me the order i assumed birth in this kal age i did not desire to come as my attention was fixed on god's feet god remonstrated earnestly with me and sent me into this world with the following orders when i created this world i first made the demons who became enemies and oppressors they became intoxicated with the strength of their arms and ceased to worship me the supreme being i became angry and at once destroyed them in their places i established the gods they also busied themselves with receiving sacrifices in worship and called themselves supreme beings mahadev called himself the imperishable god vishnu too declared himself to be god brahma called himself the supreme brahm and nobody thought me to be god then i made the eight sakis who were appointed to keep watch over creatures they told people to worship them and said there is no god but us they who did not recognize the primal essence worshipped them as god how many worshipped the sun and moon how many made burnt offerings how many worshipped the wind some recognized a stone as god how many bathed in the water according to shastric rites how many recognizing dharmraj as their supreme judge performed religious ceremonies through fear they whom i appointed to watch over creatures on coming into this world call themselves god they altogether forgot my orders and became absorbed each in his own praise when they did not recognize me then i created men they too fell under the influence of pride and made gods out of stones then i created the sids and the sods and they too found not the supreme being whoever was clever in the world established his own sect and no one found the creator enmity contention and pride increased men began to burn trunk and leaves in their own fire and none of them went my way they who obtained a little spiritual power struck out their own way none of them recognized the supreme being but became mad boasting of themselves none of them recognized the real essence but each became absorbed in himself then i created the supreme rikis who afterwards made their own simritis current they who were smitten by the simritis abandoned my worship they who attached their hearts to my feet did not walk in the way of the simitris brahma made the four veds and caused all to act according to them but they whose love was attached to my feet renounced the veds they who abandoned the tenets of the veds and of other religious books became devoted to me the supreme god they who follow true religion shall have their sins of various kinds blotted out they who endure bodily suffering and cease not to love me shall all go to paradise and there shall be no difference between me and them they who shrink from suffering and forsaking me adopt the way of the veds and simitris shall fall into the pit of hell and continually suffer transmigration afterwards i created the tatre who also struck out his own path he pared not his finger and nails he decorated his head with matted hair and paid no heed to my worship then i created gorak who made great kings his disciples and tearing their ears put rings in them but he thought not of the way of my love then i created ramanand who wore the garb of a bairagi 
put a wooden necklace on his neck and paid no heed to my worship they who were created by me struck out their several paths i then created mohammed and made him king of arabia he too established a religion of his own cut off the foreskins of all his followers and made every one repeat his name but no one fixed the true name in man's heart all these were wrapped up in themselves and none of them recognized me the supreme being i have cherished thee as my son and created thee to extend my religion go and spread my religion there and restrain the world from senseless acts i stood up clasped my hands bowed my head and replied thy religion shall prevail in the world when thou vouchsafest assistance on this account god sent me then i took birth and came into the world as he spoke to me so i speak unto men i bear no enmity to any one all who call me the supreme being shall fall into the pit of hell recognize me as god's servant only have no doubt whatever of this i am the slave of the supreme being and have come to behold the wonders of the world i tell the world what god told me and will not remain silent through fear of mortals as god spoke to me i speak i pray no regard to any one besides i am satisfied with no religious garb i sow the seed of the invisible i am not a worshipper of stones nor am i satisfied with any religious garb i will sing the name of the infinite and obtain the supreme being i will not wear matted hair on my head nor will i put on earrings i will pay no regard to any one but god what god told me i will do i will repeat the one name which will be everywhere profitable i will not repeat any other name nor establish any other god in my heart i will meditate on the name of the endless one and obtain the supreme light i am imbued with thy name o god i am not intoxicated with any other honour i will meditate on the supreme and thus remove endless sins i am enamoured of thy form no other gift hath charms for me i will repeat thy name and avoid endless sorrow sorrow and sin have not approached those who have meditated on thy name they who meditate on any one else shall die of arguments and contentions the divine guru sent me for religion's sake on this account i have come into the world extend the faith everywhere seize and destroy the evil and the sinful understand this ye holy men in your souls i assume birth for the purpose of spreading the faith saving the saints and extirpating all tyrants all the first incarnations caused men to repeat their names they killed no one who had offended against god and they struck out no path of real religion the gauzes and prophets who existed left the world talking of themselves none of them recognized the great being or knew anything of real religion nothing is to be obtained by putting hopes in others put the hopes of your hearts in the one god alone nothing is obtained by hoping in others put the hopes of your hearts in him some millions read the purans together how many silly persons recite the koran but these books shall be of no assistance at last and shall save no one from death's toils why not o brethren repeat the name of him who will aid you at the last moment consider spurious religion as superstition no such things will avail you on this account god created me having communicated to me the secret he sent me into the world i shall proclaim to all men what he told me i will repeat god's name and all my affairs shall prosper i will not close mine eyes or do anything for show they who wear a religious garb are deemed naught by the saints of god understand this all men in your hearts that god is not obtained by hypocrisy they who act for the sake of display shall not obtain salvation in the next world and it is only for life their affairs prosper kings on seeing their acting worship them but god is not to be found by mummery yet every one wandereth about thus searching for him he who keepeth his heart in subjection recognizeth the supreme being they who by wearing a religious garb keep the people of the world in subjection shall at last be cut with the shears of death and take up their abode in hell they who present appearances in the world experience extreme pleasure in fleecing others spurious and not worth a cowry is the religion of those who practise suspension of breath by stopping their noses they who practise spurious religion in the world shall fall into the pit of hell 
he who can in no way subdue his heart shall not go to heaven by gesticulation what god himself told me i proclaim to the world they who meditate on him shall go to heaven at last god and god's servant are both one deem not that there is any difference between them as waves produced from water are again blended with it god remaineth apart from those who indulge in wrangling and pride he is not found in the veds or the books of the mohammedans know this in your hearts o saints of god they who practise hypocrisy by closing their eyes should be treated as blind men since the road is not seen by closing one's eyes how can such persons my brethren meet the infinite how far could any one amplify this men would grow weary trying to understand it though one had a million tongues even then he would fail to recount god's praises seven my father departed for the east and bathed at various places of pilgrimage when he arrived at the trebeni priyag he passed his days in meritorious works and alms there was i conceived i was born in patna city and afterwards taken to the punjab where nurses of different kinds fondled me and tended my body in every way i received instruction in various forms when i arrived at the age to perform my religious duties my father departed to god's city eight when i obtained sovereignty i promoted religion to the best of my power i hunted various sorts of game in the forest and killed bears nilgaus and elks i afterwards left that country and proceeded to the city of paunta i enjoyed myself on the bank of the kalindri jamna and saw amusements of every kind there i selected and killed many lions and slew many nilgaus and bears fatah shah who was the king became angry with me and came to blows with me without cause here follow in the vichitar natak an account of the battle of bangani the dispatch of mian khan and alif khan to jamnu and nadan respectively to collect revenue the victory gained with the guru's assistance by raja bim chand over alif khan the dispatch of general delawar khan against the hill chiefs and of his son against the guru who was left unmolested owing to the son's flight the dispatch of delawar khan of hussein khan to reduce the guru to subjection the failure of hussein khan to carry out his orders his attack on the weaker of the hill chiefs the victory of gopal king of gulur and of ram singh king of jaswan over himat one of hussein khan's officers whom they put to death the single-handed combat between raja ram singh and jujjar singh raja of chander in which the latter was slain the dispatch by aurangzeb of his son to the panjab where the masands fearing that he would attack the guru deserted him and fled to the highest mountains the dispatch of an officer named mirza beg to support the young prince and the subsequent expedition of an army under four other officers who believing that the masands were men of wealth destroyed their houses and plundered their property all these details have been given at length in the guru's life nine they who turn away from the guru shall have their houses demolished in this world and the next they shall be laughed at here have no dwelling hereafter and be debarred from all hope sorrow and hunger shall ever attach to those who forsake the service of the saint nothing that they do shall succeed in this world and at last they shall fall into the pit of hell they who turn and fly from the guru's feet shall have their faces blackened in this world and the next the successors of both baba nanak and babar were created by god himself recognize the former as a spiritual and the latter as a temporal king babar's successors shall seize and plunder those who deliver not the guru's money they who love the guru's feet shall never see misery wealth and supernatural power shall enter the houses and sin and suffering not touch even their shadows what is a wretched enemy to him whom the friend preserveth an enemy could not even touch his shadow the fool would lose his labour who can meditate anything against those who enter the saint's protection god preserveth them as the tongue is preserved among the teeth he destroyeth their enemies and allayeth their suffering what can a miserable enemy do to him whom the friend preserveth he cannot even touch his shadow the fool shall pass away
ten all death saveth all his saints he hath tortured and destroyed all sinners he has shown wonderful things to his saints and saved them from all misery knowing me to be his slave he hath aided me he hath given me his hand and saved me Gyan pra bod neither the veds nor brahma knoweth god's secret neither vyas nor his father parasar nor his son shukdev nor the sons of brahma nor shiv knoweth god's limit all four sons of brahma know not god's time lakhs of lakshmis lakhs of vishnus and many krishans declare him indescribable thou art incomprehensible o god and fearless thou art most powerful the creator of sea and land thou art the unshaken endless unequalled immeasurable lord pure one i seek thy protection End of compositions of guru gobind singh extracts from vijitar natak section thirty six of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain compositions of guru gobind singh introduction to the hindu incantations here follow in the tenth guru's granth translations and abridgments of tales from the purans on the twenty-four hindu incarnations the following is the guru's introduction to them o god thou art the creator and the destroyer thou killest and puttest the blame on the heads of others thou dwellest apart and none can find thee wherefore thou art called the endless one they who are called the twenty-four incarnations have not found even a trace of thee o god on seeing thy saints distressed thou becomest uneasy wherefore thou art styled the kinsman of the poor at last thou shalt destroy the whole world wherefore the world calleth thee death thou aidest all the saints as occasion requireth wherefore they call thee their helper on beholding the poor thou art compassionate to them so we deem thee the friend of the poor since thou sheddest the juice of favour on the saints the world calleth thee the ocean of favour thou ever removest the troubles of the saints wherefore thou hast obtained the name of the remover of trouble thou hast come to dispel the sorrows of the saints wherefore o god thou art called the dispeller of sorrows thou remainest endless thy end cannot be found wherefore thou hast obtained the name of the endless one thou didst appoint the forms of all things in the world wherefore thou art called the creator no one hath ever seen thee anywhere wherefore thou art called the unseen thou wert never born in this world wherefore every one describeth thee as unborn brahma and the rest all grow weary of searching for thine origin vishnu and shiv what are the wretched beings after consideration and deliberation god made the moon and sun wherefore he is known as the creator ever without a garb he remaineth without a garb wherefore the world calleth him the garbless invisible is his form no one knoweth him on this account he is called the unseen his form is incomparable and unequalled he hath no concern with garbs or no garbs he bestoweth on all but beggeth from none wherefore he is recognized as the provider he is not concerned with celestial appearances or omens this fact is known to the whole world he is not appeased by incantations written or spoken or by charms no one hath found him by adopting a garb men are entangled with their own affairs no one knoweth 
the supreme god some hindus go to places of cremation others mussulmans to cemeteries but god is at neither they who visit either are ruined by worldly love and contention and the lord remaineth separate from them what is a hindu or a mussulman to him from whose heart doubt departeth the muhammadans use tasbis the hindus malas the former read the koran and the latter the purans fools have died over the discussion they were not imbued with god's deep love they who are imbued with love for the one god disregard human opinion and are happy they who recognize the primal being as the one god allow no other belief to enter their hearts they who cherish any other belief shall be debarred from meeting the friend he who knoweth the one supreme being even a little knoweth the real thing all the yogis and sannyasis the multitudes of shaven heads and mussulmans have plundered the world by their garbs the holy men whose support is god's name remain unknown the unholy practise hypocrisy for the sake of their bellies without hypocrisy they can obtain naught the men who meditate on the one being never practise hypocrisy on any one without hypocrisy they would obtain nothing for no one would bow before any of them if no one had a belly who would describe any one as rich or poor they who have concluded that god is one never practise hypocrisy on any one they give their heads but abandon not their determination they regard their bodies as nothing men who split their ears are called yogis with great deceit they betake themselves to the forest they who know not the virtue of the one name belong neither to the forest nor to the household in the beginning god was the father of the whole world from him light first proceeded i have not sufficient ability to tell the tale or to mention the names of the different creatures he created things strong and weak were produced things high and low were shown separately the primal light which is called the one god he at last infused into all his creatures know that the light of the one god is in all the souls which are in this world the whole world shall be blended with god who is described as kaurup whatever is visible and perceptible by the senses man considereth maya the one god is contained in all things but he established them all separately and he pervadeth them all unseen he will call them all separately to account they who have considered him as one have obtained the real thing the form of the one god is unequalled he is sometimes poor sometimes a prince or a king he hath given to all men their several entanglements he is separate from them and none of them hath found him he created all things separately and will destroy them all separately god accepteth not censure from any one it is he who casteth censure on others we now give the guru's remarks on the translations and abridgments of the stories of the hindu incarnations ram avatar since i have embraced thy feet i have paid regard to none besides the purans of ram the god of the hindus and the koran of rahim the god of the mussulmans express various opinions but i accept none of them the simritis the shastars and the veds all expound many different doctrines but i accept none of them o holy god by thy favour it is not i who have been speaking all that hath been said hath been said by thee 
forsaking all other doors i have clung to thine it is to thine honour to protect me whose arm thou hast grasped gobind is thy slave krishan avatar i do not at the outset propitiate ganesh i never meditate on krishan or vishnu i have heard of them but i know them not it is only god's feet i love great death be thou my protector all steel i am thy slave deeming me thine own preserve me think of mine honour whose arm thou hast taken deeming me thine own cherish me single out and destroy mine enemies may both my kitchen and my sword prevail in the world preserve me and let none trample on me be thou ever my cherisher thou art the lord i am thy slave deeming me thine own be gracious unto me perform everything for me thyself thou art the king of kings it is thou alone who cherishest the poor deeming me thy slave bestow thy favour on me i have arrived and am lying weary at thy door thou art my lord i am thy slave deeming me thy slave reach me thy hand and save me destroy all mine enemies they who loved not god while performing great penance who endured self-torment excessively heated their bodies went to banaras and read the veds very many times obtained not the real thing they gave alms so that vishnu might come into their power but they lost all their wealth they who loved god with hearty affection found him what availeth it if a crane sit closing his eyes and displaying a religious garb to the world if man ever go about bathing in water like a fish how shall he obtain possession of god if man croak day and night like a frog and fly like a bird how shall he obtain possession of god siam and all these saints say hath any one without love pleased god of those who through greed of wealth continued to loudly sing and recite god's praises and who danced but gave not their hearts thereto hath any found the way to god's wonderful world they excited laughter in the world and knew not the essence of wisdom even in their dreams the poet siam asketh if god hath been obtained by any one without love several meditated in the forest and returned home weary sids in meditation and munis in deep research have sought for god but found him not siam saith all the veds and the mohammedan books and the wisdom of the saints have thus decided hearken o saints the poet speaketh they who search with love obtain god i am the son of a brave man not of a brahman how can i perform austerities how can i turn my attention to thee o lord and forsake domestic affairs now be pleased to grant me the boon i crave with clasped hands that when the end of my life cometh i may die fighting in a mighty battle blessed is his life in this world who repeateth god's name with his mouth and meditateth war in his heart the body is fleeting and shall not abide for ever man embarking in the ship of fame shall cross the ocean of the world make this body a house of resignation light thine understanding as a lamp take the broom of divine knowledge into thy hand and sweep away the filth of timidity parasnath avatar o thoughtless fool why knowest thou not thy maker o man why knowest thou not god o heedless beast bound with worldly love 
they on whom thou reposest confidence ram krishan and the prophet whose names thou continually utterest on rising where live they now in the world and why singest thou their praises why recognizest thou not him who is now and ever shall be why idly worship stones will they yield thee any return worship him by whose worship thy work shall be accomplished and by taking whose name all thy desires shall be fulfilled o yogi yog consisteth not in matted hair why wear thyself out and kill thyself wandering consider this in thy mind the man who knoweth the supreme divine knowledge shall obtain the great reward he shall then restrain his mind in one place and not run wandering from door to door what availeth it to leave one's home run away and dwell in a forest when one's heart ever remaineth at home such a person is not an udasi boasting of thy religious fervour thou deceivest the world by the exercise of great deception thou thinkest in thy heart that thou hast abandoned worldly love but worldly love hath not abandoned thee o man with the garb religion consisteth not in wearing a garb it consisteth not in wearing matted hair and long nails or in smearing ashes on the body or dyeing thy raiment if man obtain yog by dwelling in the forest the bird ever dwelleth there the elephant ever throweth dust on his head consider this in thy heart frogs and fishes ever bathe at places of pilgrimage the cat the wolf and the crane meditate what know they of religion as thou endurest pain to deceive men do so also for god's sake thus shalt thou know great divine knowledge and quaff the supreme nectar end of compositions of guru gobind singh introduction to the hindu incantations